Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following and by viewers like you. One of the things we enjoy doing most is introducing you to men and women on the Jewish scene whom you may not know or be familiar with, but who are doing wonderful and exciting things to help shape Jewish life today and into the future. And so I'm extremely pleased to introduce you to a woman who is one of the most creative and dynamic individuals on the American Jewish scene today, Lisa Alkali Klug. And if you're meeting Lisa for the first time, you're in for a real treat. Lisa, who's a graduate of UC Berkeley, is an award-winning journalist who's written on everything from travel and technology to personal finance and business to arts and culture. She's also done some stand-up comedy, advises Schmooze, the Jewish Culture Conference, teaches at the Julicious Festivals, and most important of all, Lisa has written her first book, a huge hit in the Jewish world entitled Cool Jew, The Ultimate Guide for Every Member of the Tribe, also known as the Heapster Handbook, which in many ways is a bright, innovative, very funny overview of what Jewish is all about, which seems to resonate and excite many young Jews who find Cool Jew absolutely delicious. And Lisa, it's so wonderful to be able to meet you, and I thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm so verklempt <laughs> from that beautiful introduction. Thank you. You write. You write for the New York Times, for Forbes, for Hadassah. So at what point does the idea of creating a book about all things Jewish, and we'll talk about the nature of the book in a minute, mm -hmm. but what brings you to writing a book all about everything Jewish? Well, I've always wanted to write books. You know, like many journalists, I dreamt of something bigger, something that would stay on the shelf and not land in the recycling bin. And I had book ideas that I had floated around with different agents, and um, some seemed very promising, and I got the usual, you know, lovely rejection letters. The typical story of many, many writers. Uh -huh. And then um, I wrote two articles in the end of um, 2005. And those two articles were really about this trend that I had been watching and enjoying as, as in my own you know, experience as an American Jew. And I wrote one piece for the San Francisco Chronicle about how cool it is to be a Jew in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and another piece for the Forward about um, really eight nights of kitsch, where I took many of these innovative products like Meshuggah nuts or Hebrew the Chosen Beer or underwear that says a great miracle happened here across the tush. <laughs> I took those products and I ranked them in a candle system from low kitsch to high kitsch, Very one sweet. candle okay. to eight candles. Yeah. And in the other article, the San Francisco Chronicle piece, I looked at local innovators like the entrepreneur who made those underwear, as well as the maker of Hebrew, the chosen beer, and Meshuggah Nuts, and local filmmaker Yoav Potash, mm -hmm. and another m local filmmaker, Tiffany Schlein, who did The Tribe, which I'm sure you've heard of. Mm -hmm. um, I also looked at Rabbi Yosef Langer, who's a Chabad um, really pioneer in San Francisco, doing all kinds of really fun things like a Jewish cable car. And he was part of the team that first brought public menorah lighting to the United States, really outside of Israel. And that was in downtown San Francisco in the 1970s. So um, with those two pieces, I really saw a bigger trend of so much enthusiasm and excitement for being Jewish, a love of being Jewish, an embrace of things that are kitschy, and no longer rejecting them, but just embracing it and having fun with it, and what you could call a reverent irreverence. A reverent Irreverence. That's right. Uh, Bowie, that is your book. That's Cool Jew. That is. And I couldn't think of the right way to say it, but <laughs> you understand your book. It's a reverent irreverence. irreverence. Okay. Because it's an irreverence for sure. It's very playful and fun and in some way self deprecating and humorous, but it is based on a real reverence for Judaism, mm -hmm. a reverence and love of our heritage, our people, our history, our culture, our sense of humor, all of that. Okay. Incidentally, it's not a book you sit down and read necessarily. <laughs> right. You go through the book, and it's little thing after little thing after little thing, insights into all the things that make up the Jewish experience. And I'm saying to myself, you have an extraordinary grasp 
of Jewish culture, Jewish tradition, Jewish learning, Jewish shtick. <laughs> and I said to myself, where did that come from? Um, and I don't know if you will agree with me. Part of my reaction to the book was, the more you knew about Jewish to begin with, the more this book meant to you. As opposed to somebody coming to all things Jewish, de novo. In other words, part of my reaction was, Lisa wants to expose people who don't know Jewish to what Jewish is. And yet my reaction was, the more a person knew, the more a person could appreciate the genius of the book. How do you react to that? Well, I'm very flattered, first of all, that you would even use the word genius in my book in the same <laughs> sentence. So thank you, really. And um, there is a concept underlying the book of Hamevin Yavin. As we say in Hebrew, the one who understands will understand. In other words, the one who has a grasp of Yiddish kite, let's say, or Jewish life in the broader sense, someone who has a sense of those things will get so much of the humor that's in here. And yet, at many of my book events, people have come up to me who are converting or who are in a relationship with a Jewish person and they're not Jewish, or, you know, the wide spectrum from there to there, mm -hmm. as well as Chabadniks, mm -hmm. and say, this is really fun. Mm -hmm. I enjoy the book so much. I laugh when I read it. Mm -hmm. I share it with people. Mm -hmm. I buy it as gifts. Okay. <laughs> you know, though, the more you understand, the more you get the in jokes of the book. Yes, it's very true. It's, and it's just marvelous, just marvelous. Thank you. So where do you come from? How does Lisa become Lisa? <laughs> and, you know, I f find it striking, Lisa, that almost every website that talks about you begins by talking about the fact that you're the child of a Holocaust survivor mm -hmm. and w your parents come from different countries. That's correct. They come from? My father was born in Poland to a German Jewish speaking family by the name of Klug and my mother was born in Panama to Israelis that left Eretz Israel, that left the early state of Israel before it was actually established, mm -hmm. left the Holy Land before it was established as a Jewish state due to the riots, the anti-Jewish immigration riots in the 30s. They in were, Palestine. Correct. Mm -hmm. They were Ladino-speaking Jews whose ancestors escaped the Inquisition, mm -hmm. and they made their way to Latin America because they could easily get into the country there, into and we Panama. Should, therefore, there's a Sephardic element to your background. Yes. Okay. Yes, I am what you could say an Ashkafardic neo-Hasidic Karlobachian <laughs> Shomer Shabbat post labelification a sheepster. In other words, a pluralist. Uh-huh. Do it one by one. Okay. I'm an Ashkafardic. That we understand. Sephardic and Ashkenazic background. Yes. Because your father has an Ashkenazic background, your mother's Sephardic. Correct. Then. Neo-Hasidic. What is Neo-Hasidic? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a friend of Chabad, but I'm not Chabad. I okay. love learning Hasidut. I love learning traditional okay. but you're Hasidic, not Hasidic mysticism. No, no, no. I'm not okay. Hasidic so, so in my far, dress, okay. but uh, there's a part of my neshama, a part of my soul that is Hasidisha. And why is it Hasidisha, not Yiddishkeit? Oh, well, Yiddishkeit is Judaism. Yes. And Hasidish means there's like this part of me that gets engaged. When I hear the Karlibachs singing their niganim, I just want to be in there with them. And what kind of synagogue were you brought up in? I was brought up in what you could call a traditional conservative synagogue. So it was a conservative synagogue, technically part of the conservative movement, but we had an Orthodox rabbi. So you asked earlier, where, did, where do yes, I come from? Yes. So I come from this little town in Southern California where the shul was founded in part by my uncle, my father's brother, his oldest brother in the family, the first of seven children who escaped Nazi Europe, came eventually to the United States via Panama, where he had met my mother's family years prior, helped establish this shul, and I grew up going to this little shul. Mm -hmm. And I grew up hungry for everything Jewish. Warm memories? Oh, yeah. I, I love that little shul. <laughs> and I, um, I have very fond memories of sitting in shul, w even without understanding the prayers when I was very young, feeling comforted by the familiarity and the beauty and the richness of the songs, and holding my mother's hand and playing with her fingers, or holding my father's seat seat and playing with that. And it's transportive, you know, that memory. is yes, still It I still do. calls me in a very deep way, and I feel very at home in synagogue because of that. Mm -hmm. Are you an only child? No, I have several siblings, and we all have our own unique way of relating to Judaism, and we all have some kind of relationship to Hasidic thought and experience. Mm -hmm. my, you... I should say that my father comes from a Hasidic family. 
pre-war. My father's family were Ger Hasidim, but they dressed with modern clothing. So in the family portrait, you wouldn't know that they were a Hasidic family. But my father tells but me that's the neshama where, is Hasidic. The neshama is Hasidic. Okay. And in terms of observance of your home, again, mm -hmm. mainstream conservative? You could call it that, yes. We, um, you know, we went to shul every Friday night, but my father worked on Saturday. He felt a lot of financial pressure to do that. Um, we always had a Seder, and we didn't eat you know, all kinds of foods during Passover. But my mother was in charge of our diet, so she fed us all kinds of Sephardi things, you know, like peanuts and uh, corn chips and things that yes. Ashkenazim do not yes. eat during Passover. Yes. And, um, Shabbat in your home? We always had Friday night dinner. Mm -hmm. The great tragedy of my childhood is that I was not allowed to become a cheerleader. <laughs> because of I, Friday night? Because of Friday night. Oh, boy. We had the same background. <laughs> I didn't want to be a cheerleader, but uh, it was part of what we did. There mm -hmm. were certain things you could, not, you had to give up, because Friday night and Shabbat was so important in the family. Yes. Um, I think in the end, not being a cheerleader served me quite well because <laughs> I got involved with student leadership instead, and that gave me some skills that that have benefited me. Were you also involved in a youth group? Well, it was very weak. We were well outside of Los Angeles. I see. There were no kosher restaurants. There was not an active youth program. There was a Hebrew school, but my father is such a traditional um, thinker on this that his daughters were not prepared for bat mitzvah, only his son, my brother. So we went to religious school every Sunday, but no Hebrew school. Did so you I, learn Hebrew as a child? No, not as a child, but I learned Hebrew as an adult. You go to Berkeley. Yes. Are you active Jewishly at Berkeley? As an undergraduate. Yes. Yes. In fact, it might, not seem, <laughs> it might not seem like an obvious Jewish choice for many students today, but at the time, I wanted to go to the best school that I could. I wanted to go to the best school that I could afford because I largely put myself through college. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to a school that had Hebrew and a program in Israel and an active student board, and they had all of that. I wrote for the Jewish student paper when I was undergrad at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. By the way, not to embarrass you, but we should say you're Phi Beta Kappa from Berkeley. Yeah, thank so you. you did well. And were some of your studies in the Jewish Studies Department? My major was Middle Eastern Studies, and so I spent my junior year in Israel. I started taking Hebrew my first... How was that, by the way? It was phenomenal. Tell me. Well, you know, I was one of those classic kids who had never really seen massive numbers of Jewish people. So to finally land in Israel and realize this is all Jewish, or so much of it is Jewish, this calendar is Jewish, and I had so much family there that I had never met. I have scores and scores of cousins in Israel. That was thrilling. And just to be exposed to everything that I had been like learning on playing cards, you know, <laughs> on all these bookmarks and these other dorky souvenirs that our relatives had brought from Israel all these years, it was really thrilling. And at the time, when I first got to Israel, I started to wonder, do I need a spiritual expression in Judaism? Or will I be a Jew like Israelis are a Jew? You know, how many Israelis identify more with the you know, concept of nationality and belonging to the Jewish people in that regard and less so in a religious context. And I experimented with that. I later came back and called the Homer even more so. Why? I think because I was looking for depth, meaning, authenticity, consistency. You know, I enjoyed the Jewish practice of my childhood very much, as I've explained, and it's been very enriching for me to continue in that path, and I love it. Okay, so you go around everywhere, mm -hmm. and you're seeing young people and young Jews, and there are certain things I think would excite you, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but at the moment, Lisa, what is it that either gives you pause or creates concern in you as you come in contact with Jews of your age and younger? Well, there are a few words really to describe that, so self-hatred, apathy, neglect, uninformed critique. I think that would sum it up. You know, when I see young people um, disregarding where they come from, where we come from, without experience or exposure or knowledge of how beautiful the Jewish culture is, in whatever way you experience that or express it, that is very troubling to me. And it's on us, it's on the rest of us to help invite them back or in, in a deeper, more inviting, more engaging way. You know, that's actually, you could say, the success of Chabad, right? Because they're so out there. They are so willing to go out to anyone, and they do it so often with an incredible warmth and authenticity, and people respond to that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you 
an example of some things kids say. Okay. And I want you to, what would you answer them? Okay. Okay. There is a sense among many young people, many young Jews, that they're part of a larger world. Yes. And that they want to be open to everyone and everybody and every style. And that the Jewish is too particular. And that every part of the world reaches out to them. Mm -hmm. And that if they turn inward, they're in some way shutting themselves off from the greater experience of the world. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What would you say? Well, I don't see being Jewish or being informed, celebratory, and joyous about being Jewish as um, something that happens in isolation or in a vacuum. And in fact, it's very important to me that we build bridges, that we have cross cultural exchange, that we expose ourselves to the beauty of the world. You know, I, I have a, a dear teacher who says, we are all God's children. And I say that very flatly in the book. We are all very God's Jewish. children. Just some of us a little more Hebrew than others. <laughs> uh -huh. So there's, to me, there's no contradiction, or for me, there's no contradiction between being an informed Jew, really down, out there, proud and celebratory, and being informed, celebratory, and enjoying everything else that the world, you know, celebrates in terms of culture and people. We're not, we're not meant to live, you know, pretending that we are the only people on the planet. And um, in spiritual terms, we have a light to share. That is our light. Our light is the ethical and moral teachings of Judaism. And that's just one way to experience that with the rest of the world. Lisa, what's your feeling about intermarriage? I know it's a huge challenge facing the Jewish people, and it's something that I've experienced in my own family. So I have a brother who's married to a non-Jewish woman. He has two beautiful children who I love very much. And it's important to me that they're in my life and that I'm in their life. And they know, and they're very proud, actually, that they have an auntie who knows a lot about being Jewish. And they can come to me and ask me questions. And I feel it's very important to keep the door open. And without having a relationship, the door would be closed. Does it matter if Jews marry Jews? I do think it matters if Jews marry Jews. Why? And probably the best way for me to answer that is personally. You know, I'm not married. And I would like to find a life partner that I can share my lifestyle with in the richest way. I get emails, you know, from strangers now, and someone asks me, would you date a Catholic? <laughs> it's like, well, I appreciate the, the question, but I don't think that's in the cards for me. And what is in the cards for me is building a strong Jewish home and passing on this Masoret, passing on this tradition, passing on this passion, this love. Some people are able to do that in intermarriages. I don't think that's my path. Yeah. Why does it matter to you that there be more Jewish families and that Jews marry Jews. Can you articulate, and when I, I, why am I asking you? Look, yeah, we, why are you asking I'll me? I'll tell you why. <laughs> we, have, we have many, many people watching, and there are many young people watching. And I believe if, if people know that the author of Cool Jew is going to be on, they're going to watch. And I'm asking you to explain to anybody who might care about what you think, why you feel, where it is inside you, and what you feel, why is it yes? And it's not like we're critical of somebody who doesn't marry a Jew. Mm -hmm. But if you had to say what you would like to have happen, you would like Jews to marry Jews. Why? I feel that Judaism is this precious jewel. And it is. It's right here. It's this precious jewel. I inherited it. It was a stroke of luck. I know there are many among us who choose to embrace this jewel and to own it fully. And I applaud that, really. And I want other people to know how beautiful that jewel is, and I want it to continue. We do have a light to bring to the rest of the world. We do have a responsibility as Jews to show each other how beautiful it is. Incidentally, you did choose Jewish. I know you were born Jewish. I know it was a gift given to you by your parents. But as I see your life, you are one of those who has chosen to find in it so much richness and so much expression, the jewel you talk about. In many ways, you Thank should you. feel so proud, not only because you wrote a book, but about who you are. You have chosen somehow to 
embrace this in a way that is giving to other people. And you know, the Jew Jewish tradition teaches us that every Jew, even if you're born a Jew, must become a Jew by choice. Every Jew is supposed to feel that he is choosing Jewish every year from Passover to Shavuot. And it's something that I feel you have done with extraordinary passion and mind. When you hear that there are young Jews who would say that if the state of Israel were to disappear, it would not affect them personally. What's your reaction to that? I feel a sense of sadness when I hear that. I knew from early on that Israel saved my family. My father had a brother and sister who left Nazi Europe. They made it to Israel with Youth Aliyah. They settled on Kibbutzim. They took Israeli names. They worked the land. They joined the Haganah. They fought in the army. Their children fought in the army. Their grandchildren have fought in the army or are in the army now. And, um, but there's more than that. There's the beauty of and the experience of being in a place where you do see it is our home. And it, without Israel, we would not be the same Jewish people outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like when someone says that it wouldn't affect them, it's because they haven't had the amazing, life-changing, transformative experience of being in Israel. You know, young people grow up now thinking there always was a state of Israel. Yes. The Holocaust is somewhere around the American Revolution. It isn't yesterday anymore. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the events which drove my generation and my parents' generation that your parents lived through yes. and that they have given you a gift. That's a, from my perspective, they've given you a gift. And I wish your father hadn't been through the Holocaust mm -hmm. and isn't a Thank survivor. You. But having said that, there are gifts he's given you which he can only give you based on where he has come from. That is very, very true, and yeah. I talk about it at every talk I give. I, I pause my presentation where I'm showing funny, funny slides, and I show the family portrait that my uncle smuggled out of Nazi Europe by folding in his shoe and bringing it first to Panama and then to the United States. There's already one sibling missing in that for portrait. There's my father's young man, and there's the person I'm named for who's no longer living, my uncle Lippmann. There's my Aunt Rose who was killed with her parents, my grandparents. They were all deported to Trelbinka. I pause the presentation. It's important for me to share that information because I do understand that it is remote for many, many people. And I have to say that as um, enthusiastic as audiences are about the humor and the fun in the book, again and again and again, people say to me, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing the personal story that you shared with the family portrait. And they say, tell more about that, share more what it was like for you to hear those stories from your family and share more of your family's experience. And I want to pick up on what you've just said and understand this is it, this has, takes nothing away from Cool Jew. I understand what you're doing in Cool Jew. But you have a very important message to give. And it's not, and this is humor. Yes. You're very funny. <laughs> and you know, there's all kinds of funny, but your funny is bright funny. And again, I, I'll Thank say Thank you. To you. I'm going to start I, blushing I, I, here. I, again, I believe the more you know about Jewish, the more you appreciate cool Jew. But there's another side to you, and it's this side. And I believe that if I were in a room with you, even as I'm in a room with you now, listening to you speak to a group of people, as funny as, as much fun as funny is, I would want to hear this more from you. You have a very sweet but powerful way of speaking about what is really at the essence of Jewish. And lest anybody misunderstand, you don't mean to trivialize Judaism no. or Jewish history or Jewish life because you're funny. It isn't about trivializing. What you're trying to do is find a way with humor to express what is profound for you. Am I right? That's true. Yes. What I find beautiful and rich and expansive in the tradition I try to convey with a lot of humor because that opens doors to people's hearts, right? Yes. And, and I want the book to be an entry point for all kinds of readers, right? For the convert, for the non-Jew involved in a relationship with a Jewish person, for, you know, the president of a university that I spoke at the other day said to me, I have two sons, and now I have two Jewish daughter-in-laws, and I'm going to have Jewish grandchildren. I really need to get your book. <laughs> and there are people like that all over America. And then, there, of course, there are people with 
on this wide spectrum with less to more information and experience and exposure to what it is to be Jewish, as you say. Mm -hmm. So the book is really meant for everyone, and yet at, at its core, my message is always, you don't have to work hard to be cool. If you're a heapster, you just got to be Jew. Yes, but you understand, yeah. I don't understand a word of that. Really? Yeah, that idiom isn't the idiom I grew up with or understand. What are you trying to say with heapster? I'm trying to say that it is so fun to be Jewish. It's just fun. And because of this book, I'm able to bring a little bit of Purim into every day. A little more Purim into every day. That's this book, right? But at its, at its core, this book is also about really emphasizing the, the same words I keep using, but beauty, death, expansiveness, celebra celebration, fun of being Jewish. And so I close my presentations by saying, when you're a heapster, you don't have to work hard to be cool. You just got to be Jew. Jew and Jew and Jew and Jew and Jew. And I pointed everybody, including myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that you might appreciate in this sense in the book that relates to my father's experience is that my father always says, never, ever be ashamed to be a Jew. So I took that message on its inverse to use the book to show how joyous and wonderful it can be to be Jewish. And in that way, this book is an antidote for Jewish self-hatred. And on page 219, there is a dotted line that appears vertically in the book. You cut along that dotted line, and you give the book a bris. <laughs> it's called the Certificate of Circumcision. Mm -hmm. And like many pop culture titles, you end up with a diploma certificate by removing that page. But this certificate shows that you have removed all self-hatred from your incomparable Yiddish neshama, your incomparable Jewish soul. And you've replaced it with the steadfast nachas, the steadfast, intranslatable, you know, sense of pride and joy in being Jewish. There's an open Torah scroll, it's blank, and you fill your name into the Torah scroll. What I wish for you now is every personal and professional success you can possibly have. Thank you so beginning much. Beginning with Cool Jew, and uh, there are certain books which will become part of every home library. It will not surprise me if Cool Jew, Lisa, is one of the books which Jews will have in their home as a resource. I, you know, I keep saying, you see it also as a window into. For me, it's, it's an affirmation of what the richness of Jewish life is in every facet, done with intelligence and wit. I also hope one day you write a book just about, that comes out of your soul, about all the things that excite you intellectually and emotionally about Jewish. You have so much more to give. I now await your next book. You don't mind my putting that burden on you, do you? No, I don't mind at all. Thank okay. you so much. Lisa Alkali Klug, author of Cool Jew, published by Andrews McNeil Publishing, selling for $12.99. And you can purchase this book at any major bookstore or obviously on Amazon.com. Or you can visit CoolJewBook.com. What a terrific name. CoolJewBook.com. Or another website that Lisa has created, TolerantNation.WordPress.com. So if you want Cool Jew, be sure you pick it up. Of course, as always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to the ideas expressed by Lisa. Please email me or write me this week. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $18 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support.